Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining the Great Dynamics Podcast. I'm your host, Ahmed Hassan. And as always, we have a very interesting guest today. With me is Professor Rory Cormack. He's a professor at International Relations, specializing in secret intelligence and covert action, Nottingham University. Rory has written six books. His most recent one, which I'm really looking forward to, is How to Stage a Coup and Tell Other Lessons from the World of Secret Statecraft. He has worked on several documentaries and is a frequent commenter on COVID action, secret intelligence. In British media, Rory also spoke at British and US government institutions like the MOD and the Pentagon. Rory, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So how did you get where you are today? What was, what was your path like? Well, the first thing is, it's, it's funny because that, that bio, when it says, Professor Rory Cormack specializes in intelligence and covert operations. I always feel, feel like it, I should change it. It's, <laughs> Professor Rory Cormack specializes in the study of intelligence or covert operations. It's entirely my fault. Apologies. No, 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 it's, 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 it's me. Because I write this thing on the back of the book. It's saying, like, what's, your, what's your research area? And I always write, you know, Rory Cormack specializes in intelligence and covert ops. And it always makes me smile. Like, I mean, it's an out the University of Nottingham. Like, I'm waging these covert operations inside the university <laughs> against my employers. It's, it's great. So, yes, I specialize in studying intelligence and covert operations. And I do that studying at the university. I must confirm, I'm not wa- waging subversion operations from my office in Nottingham. My path was I started off, I did a PhD on intelligence analysis and the Joint Intelligence Committee with Professor Mike Goodman down at King's College London which was great fun. But then there was a bit in that project where I came across a new committee, which sounds very, very boring. So I was doing a PhD on the Joint Intelligence Committee. And then suddenly I found this thing called the Joint Action Committee. And then I was like, well, this sounds more fun. And after that, I ditched the Joint Intelligence Committee and focused on on this new thing, which was doing covert action. And I just found it so interesting. I found it was all about British operations in Yemen in the 1960s and you know, subversion operations, some sabotage stuff, some propaganda. And I, just, I found that, if I'm perfectly honest, so much more interesting than the intelligence assessment side of things. And went from there, really. Um, ended up writing, used that as a springboard to write a whole book on the history of British cave operations from 1945, and then broaden that out further with my re- most recent book about how to stage a coup, which isn't just about Britain, but draws on those different countries because i think one of the problems with our understanding is that all of this is limited to very small case studies or very few prisms so it's it's normally the cia um, or from a british context we're looking at mi6 but actually covert operations are a regular form of of statecraft lots of states do this stuff and we we don't realize that we don't accept it at the same time i don't want to overplay the hidden hand and kind of go down the conspiracies route of all this stuff being called by intelligence agencies. That's not the case at all. But covert operations are a part of international statecraft. And that's the kind of the, the, the journey that I've realized as a scholar. And it's something that I wanted to explore in a bit more detail in how to stage coup. Thank you so much. And I think maybe you maybe you have but you have not expected me to ask this question. What are your thoughts on what just happened in Germany? <laughs> well, this is this is particularly bizarre because the, the other the other thing I didn't mention there in my academic career history is I just wrote a book on British intelligence and the royal family as well and the relationship between between the two and this stuff that's happening in Germany has made me made me smile. Obviously, it's, 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 it's terrible, but it bizarrely combined my two niche research interests of minor royals. And intelligence and coups, where we hear the ringleader of this coup is is alleged to be a, a minor minor German prince, and it made me think of stuff I was writing about, but taking back to the 19th century when we're talking about minor German princes and coups and all this sort. Of, obviously, I, you know, I I don't I know as much as anybody else. I don't know I don't know have any special insight. Two points I would make. The first point is, as has been made to me, one would assume that something, the Russians are stoking something up, giving some sort of support or sucker. And I would be very surprised if they were not. But on the other hand, second more important point perhaps, is we mustn't underestimate internal agency in all of these things and the internal dynamics behind coups and disaffection, 
which are only ever exploited um, by external actors. There's an interplay between the two, um, but it's certainly a very a very curious situation, and I look forward to reading more as as more evidence gets released and as developments unfold. Maybe a I don't know if, we, if 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 there's a real answer for this question, but do coups work? Aha, there is, <clears throat> there is, and the answer is sometimes, which is not, <laughs> which is not a very helpful, actually <laughs> not a very helpful answer. So the the the, the 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 important point I think to make here is that there are two ways of thinking about work and success Mm -hmm. and often coups can work just like any form of regime change any form of covert regime change can can work it can lead to a change in that regime the most successful according to academic studies is electoral interference covert electoral interference rather than coups for various reasons Um, it's easier to meddle in open democracy than it is against a a single one-party state which has spent generations coup proofing but it, they, they can work. They can lead to a, to a change in, you know, in a way which the sponsor is hoping for. But, and there's a catch, does that mean they then work in the longer term? That they then lead to what the sponsoring government actually wants to happen, i.e. closer relationships between the target and the sponsor? And the answer there is not necessarily and states can and have covertly meddled, changed regimes, put supposedly friendlier people in place, but the actual relationship between the two countries haven't made much of a much of a difference. So yes, they can work, as in the change can happen, but if that actually leads to what the state wants to happen, is a whole other question. So uh, one of, one of the reasons why I got interested in your work is somebody pointed me to your work because, but let me ask the question and I can give a bit of a background in it. So the, the book that you, that you wrote, uh, with Richard Aldrich, the black door, I was, I was told to look at that book. We wrote an article on the website and it was very short and we write a lot about COVID action and it was on E squadron or increment and we got pushback from that via somebody said, you know, maybe better because it's not correct. And, you know, it would devalue the rest of your work and maybe better to take that down, which I, which really surprised me because it didn't have, and I have an intelligence background myself, it didn't have any sources and methods or anything compromising. And it was all open source. Did you, because you've been delving into this for a long time, did you ever get pushed back or maybe like an email saying, hey, you shouldn't be doing this or? Honestly, everything that I have written and researched and seen, same for any co-authors that I've worked with in the past, uh, it's, it's all based on open source, as you were just describing, open source declassified material, mostly archival material. I mean, I don't <clears throat> tend to do lots of interviews with practitioners or former practitioners. Kind of gets get into quite murky, murky worlds of official secrets acts and things. I mean, I've, I've signed nothing. I am entirely unofficial. I'm an academic historian, and the, the vast, vast, vast majority of our research, our insight, comes from declassified archival documents, which have been declassified by the government. Now, sometimes, on very rare occasions, those things get reclassified uh, if they realise they've released something in, in error. But because of that, we've never We've never had any pushback. We've never had anyone saying, are you sure you should be publishing this or looking at this? Because it's all out there. What we do, and I think we're reasonably good at, is being able to get lots and lots of small little pieces of a jigsaw puzzle and try and put them together. I mean, take uh, MI6, take Special Forces. They don't have declassified files in the archive. There is no MI6 file series. There's no SAS file series. So what we have to do is look through things like treasury files, foreign office files, the very, very dull files, and just pick together little bits of jigsaw pieces and, and try and put them together. And now you know, we, we, we're confident in our conclusions. We, we, we think we're robust scholars. When you're dealing with this kind of stuff, one would assume the old era creeps in, but we've never we've never had 
serious pushback, either on classification or on errors. So I'll take that as a win. Yeah, definitely. I mean, do you think there is a difference in culture between the UK and the US, where in the US yeah. it's, it seems much more accepted? Big time. I think there's a huge culture difference. Uh, I'll give you a really bizarre example. We sometimes end up flying to America at great expense to research British history because the Americans have declassified their material. And there's things, episodes which remain classified, but you fly over to America and see the American side of the story. And it helps actually put different pieces together, particularly around stuff on the, on the Queen and the royal family. We went out to America to, to look at some of that stuff. And we, we, which is odd. And I, there does seem to be a different culture. So, for example, the CIA material, it's all, it's all online. You can, not all of it, obviously, but a lot, a lot of it is online. You can sit in the comfort, I say to my students, you can sit in the comfort of your own bedroom on the internet reading declassified CIA documents in a way that you just cannot do in the UK. I think there are various historical, political, cultural reasons behind this difference, but it is, it is quite striking. And then it's the same when it comes to, to COVID action. You know, the Americans have a clear declassified definition of this. Britain doesn't. Britain has a range of euphemisms um, and most recently talk about effects operations. Uh, but it's, it's, it's quite a striking difference between, between the two countries. I'd say it's more challenging researching the UK, but then I would, because that's what I do. It's, it's a, yeah, for me, it's, it's surprising because if we write about like units that are tend to be used for COVID action in the US, we write an article about that. You will get one or two people that were in the unit, like sending me a message and saying, like, I don't know how you did it, but you got, you got it pretty accurate, you know, and, or, you know, maybe you should change this because this is not really true. It's sensationalized. But when it comes to like British units or any other country for that matter, that would probably never happen. I think, I think the, I, I agree with you. And I think the Americans are, it's, it, I prefer that level of openness. It doesn't seem to compromise stuff. What, what's quite striking, I think, or the, the worry is that when a state is too closed, when it fetishizes secrecy to too high a degree, that that creates a vacuum and that vacuum ends up being filled with nonsense and myths and hyperbole. And to go back to your example about um, East Quadrant, I mean, that I don't think has been officially declassified by the government. Um, I only, my only knowledge of it comes from BBC articles, uh, a reputable source. But there was a, there was a big s scoop or expose on it in the Sun, I think, the Sun newspaper last year. And um, because there's a vacuum of information, the general public then get their knowledge of this stuff through big exposing in the sun. And the big exposing in the sun used every single trope or cliche you could possibly imagine. And this isn't a criticism of the, of the, of the newspaper per se. It's, it's how journalism works. It talks about legends of the SAS. It talks about boys' owned operations. It talks about crazy stuff. They even, even have a picture of Princess Diana kind of alluding to various conspiracy theories, in which he made a very clear point of saying MI6 special forces were not involved in that. But just having the picture there, I don't think is particularly helpful. And so because we have that fetishization of secrecy, it creates a vacuum. That vacuum gets filled with Bond and Bourne and the Sun and SAS legends. <clears throat> and I think that's problematic for our understanding. And we need to be able to understand this stuff as part of a liberal democracy. I am all in favor of secrecy and classification to protect things, I massively, massively. But there's got to be a balance. I don't always think we get it right. And I think going too far down the secrecy route ends up creating unhelpful myths, which are problematic. Have you ever heard of what, uh, there's a graphic novel or comic called The Activity? No. So it's, it's written, there's two people behind it, but the illustrator also did the Punisher series for Marvel. And the activity is about the intelligence support activity, probably the most covert military unit in the US. They do signals and all that kind of stuff. And 
the, the comic was written with the help of former operators. So they didn't declassify anything or any sort of methods, but it came out really well. And I think it's better to do that, to make sure that the stories are tell, told correctly and you don't get this, this sensationalism. And, and I say that, I say that as a practitioner, but this is also an intelligence analysis, the, the fetishization of, of, I'm going to say this now all the time of secrecy, because even in the private sector, you would see that clients put a overemphasis on, of what did the source tell you instead of what, what did open sources tell you, right? And, and there's this belief that what people have to say is more important, even though most often that's not the case. Well, that was one of our main conclusions from the book you mentioned earlier with Richard Aldrich about prime ministers. It was the, one of the traps that prime ministers have always fallen into, indeed many political intelligence consumers, and it sounds similar in, you, in your experience in the private sector, is, is falsely equating top secret with true. They see the phrase top secret, they see, that they see it comes from a top secret human source, particularly when it comes from a human source, and they think that that is infallible and it is true, and it is way more valuable than an open source. When, you know, you know as well as I do, you're better than I do, that this is not necessarily the case. And that's constantly been a, a fallacy, a trap. Margaret Thatcher was terrible for it, apparently, to the extent that certain of her, of her staff would, would write the word top secret on a document, knowing that she would then read it. That's crazy. I've seen this, I don't know if you followed this, but there is this rise in, in, in the Sahel, many West African nations of it's like, uh, I don't like the, the media portrayal of it because uh, again, it's sensationalized as if coup d'etats are like in vogue right now, but there is a certain trend in West African countries of coups. And I mean, Russia is, is quickly blamed for that, but do, do you have any insights on that? Well, not in specific instances, but I think what's an important an important point to make is that there, there, there have always been coups for, for as long as there have been states, and often there is a tendency to overplay the agency of the of the hidden hand and to and to assume that the covert action is what is the deciding factor. Now, in so many cases, the CIA, KGB, whomever in, in, in parts of Africa, the French, would, would want a change of government. And there might be some sort of covert action to try and bring about a change of government. But one of the traps we often fall into as commentators or, or scholars is then assuming that because the intelligence agency wanted X to happen, and X ended up happening, that the hidden hand caused X. And it's actually a very intricate interplay between internal factors and external factors. But because people are interested in simpler explanations or interested in scapegoats or interested in conspiracies and, and, and power of intelligence services, which are all very real, don't get me wrong for a second, but there's a danger that we overplay the, the power, the potency, the omnipotence of intelligence agencies in sponsoring these things. And I think we in the West have fallen into this trap a little bit with Putin over the years, maybe less so since his invasion of Ukraine, which has obviously not gone to plan. But they've almost like talked up the power and the potency of Russian covert operations against the West as being everywhere and being behind everything and being super powerful. Now, I am sure that Putin and, and the Kremlin is, is is doing lots of stuff. We, we, we know this, there's, there's plenty of evidence, but we shouldn't overestimate the impact and the potency of that stuff, particularly when it means that we're not addressing our own internal causes, internal divisions. It's very easy to, to, to blame external hidden hands for bringing negative consequences to us. It allows us not to look 
be, be a bit more introspective and look at our own failures and problems. So I think coups have always existed. They are driven by internal factors and occasionally external factors or external hands will nudge those internal factors along. They nudge history along. And we need to be wary of thinking that foreign power X is behind all of these individual things because it's not necessarily the case. That's a fair assessment, I think. One other thing that that seems to be a trend, I don't know if it's a trend, but mainly due to the Ukraine invasion, it seems to be on the rise. But the the best way I can explain it is scholar spies that, that have been being caught all, all over the place. Like in the, in the Netherlands, there was a Brazilian, but as supposedly it was a Russian GRU officer. And in Norway, we've seen it in a couple of other places. What do you think of the, yeah, that, that interplay of using academia as, as an entryway into information collection or subversion? Well, I certainly wouldn't want to draw too many conclusions about academia as a whole from a couple of cases. There are, yeah, I agree there have been, there have been a couple. And I think that academia allows, in a, in a largely unsuspecting, it allows ways into or sometimes access to interesting policy types. But at the same time, I certainly wouldn't want to cast aspersions or start wondering that every second academic might be a might be a Russian spy because I'm sure I'm sure that that wouldn't be the that wouldn't be the case. But they're, they're gonna they're gonna be recruiting uh, assets or having undercover officers where where they can and where they think has the most potential to be impactful. But at the same time. I've seen lots of stories recently in the UK anyway about Russian spies in every coffee shop as your as your barista in the in the FSB. And and I think as ever with intelligence, we need to keep this stuff in perspective and not whip up that that frenzy about every yeah, every, every every waiter is a is a Russian spy. It reminded me of um some of that coverage anyway, it reminded me of the spy scares before World War One, where the, the tabloid press were whipping up every waiter it was is your waiter a german spy and they see kind of echoes of that today so as with all these things i mean as, as you as you well know it's important to to keep this stuff in in perspective i think yeah i think also yesterday i think i read that the irani government set up I think i oh, wasn't no sorry not irani i should not blame the wrong state but north korea north korea funded think tanks to, to gather more knowledge, information from scholars and, 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 and other experts. But how is that different than the Saudi government or the Emirati government funding think tanks in Europe, existing ones that are very well known? Yeah, it's, it's tricky. It's, it's, it's a spectrum. And I think where it becomes more controversial is where these things are not probably acknowledged as being state-sponsored. Once you start trying to run things through straw men companies or proxies or hiding the the source of the the funding, then that becomes particularly problematic. I think there's a second problem in with the UK academia anyway. And I saw in the news yesterday about, I think it was Lincoln University was getting, got a big exposure in the time for them taking a few hundred thousand from Chinese companies, which have been sanctioned by America. And British universities, if there's, choose my words carefully, given that I'm working in a British university, st- stuck in a difficult position whereby funding from the government is massively drying up and staff all over, everywhere are being under immense pressure to go and bring in external money and to bring in international money and to bring in to and to have impact in academic jargon you know to impact policymakers and, and all this kind of stuff and we are in mean, academics are constantly under pressure to do all this and i think that creates that might negative have again choose words carefully the repercussions for staff's ability to judge risk and where some of the you know these, these contacts and colleagues and money comes from if you're you're your entire career trajectory is linked to how much external money you bring in, then that's kind of, that could 
cloud an academic's judgment when they're dealing with foreign funded think tanks or dual use technology or whatever. And I don't, not to defend these academics, but that's the, the, the pressure, the system in which they work, which, let's be honest, is very exploitable by hostile foreign states. You can run right for the taking, and the government needs to, if they're serious about clamping down on this, which they should be, I think it was you know, it's bad. We, it's worrying what was reported yesterday about Lincoln in the Times. It needs to better support academics and better invest in universities. I think that's the that's the answer. All this stuff is long term. This counter subversion is it's long term, requires money, not easy, quick wins. Yeah, I think it's also unfair to expect from academics to understand the threats like somebody who, who would know this stuff. So like, if you're put in that predicament, then how would you be able to do your due diligence? And right, I, I think it's not really a fair position to put academics in. Yeah, I would, I would naturally be inclined to agree with that. I mean, academics are, are busy wanting to do great research. They don't want they need support around all the geopolitical aspect and ultimately any better funding from the government but that's a that's a conversation for a different podcast <laughs> i think most academics would agree with you on that one i was interested also in if you could give us a bit of a maybe a quick summary if that's possible on the role of the crown and, and intelligence and that interplay in the uk this i found this so interesting i am not a royal historian. I am not a self-proclaimed royal expert by any stretch of the imagination. And my understanding, knowledge of, of all this was the crown had nothing to do with intelligence and the queen would just, you know, rock up and cut her ribbons and, and, and do her constitutional duties with her, wearing her crown opening parliament. And that was it. And I, with, with Richard Aldous, wrote this book on tracing the evolution from Victoria all the way through to the present day. And it I really struck me that the Queen was a human library of state secrets. It really struck me that nobody, and I genuinely believe this, I'm not hyper hyperbolically, nobody in the history of the world knew more state secrets than Queen Elizabeth II did, because she was receiving this stuff every week, for decades, decades and decades and decades and decades. She was receiving top secret material, even before she became queen, to do with Ultra and Bletchley Park and things like that, all the way through until her, her death. And this allows her, or allowed her, to, to execute her constitutional right of warning, advising, and encouraging prime ministers. She's incredibly well briefed. She doesn't, didn't step into politics, but knowledge is power. And knowing all of this secret material, when she meets prime ministers, and not just prime ministers, you know, foreign secretaries, intelligence chiefs, she, she met ambassadors. Uh, she's able to ask a question, to raise an eyebrow. I think if her, her apparent catchphrase of, are you sure this is wise, Prime Minister? I mean, she, she's, she never told them what to do because that would be a breach of constitutional duty. But she's allowed to encourage, advise, warn. And to help her do that, she is impeccably briefed with amazing sources. And, and I, found that, I found that quite striking. And of course, as the crowns come out of the shadows a bit after the 1990s, and as intelligence services have come out of the shadows from the 1990s, you start to see that the two are almost bound up together in, in popular culture, epitomised with the Queen and James Bond doing that skit in the 2012 London Olympics opening ceremony. And now we have Prince William doing work experience with, the, with all three British intelligence agencies, um, openly and publicly. You have Prince Charles, as he then was, uh, being the page, the patron, that's what I'm trying to say, the patron of the intelligence agencies and giving awards out. So they, they, they're becoming inextricably connected in a way which I think is is very interesting. To that, this is just an observation. Uh, US presidents look, you know, whatever they, they, they leave the presidency because the weight of, of their responsibility and, and no secrets. 
Uh, I find it fascinating that Queen Elizabeth was so stoic and seemingly unflappable and, and, and carried it well, actually, you know, and for a long time. She did. And through the process of writing the book, I actually went on a, my own journey to use reality TV language. I went on my own personal journey with the monarchy. I started off being a, I suppose, an agnostic, light Republican wrote the book and became a light monarchist because of, I thought that she, I thought you know, it, it was it was quite impressive what she'd done and, and, and the way that she so she now recent events come more back towards the ag agnostic but you, I, it's, it's it's impressive it's it's impressive how much information she had how she marshaled it the amount of foreign diplomats exclaiming how well briefed she was in the american archives you see stuff not meant for english audiences so they're not they're not sucking up um saying look i had a conversation with her majesty about the middle east she knew everything and every wall and all the stuff that was going on in a way that the foreign secretary didn't and i think that's that's really impressive uh, it's very interesting when you look at i think we touched upon it earlier when we look at certain countries like the US being a bit more open, or a lot more open than, than the British government. You see that, and I would like to hear your opinion on this, that, for example, the Mossad is very, they don't communicate as much, but all of their COVID action is very public. And what, what is your opinion on that? Well, I think that COVID action is a, is a funny old term. Um, given that it covers a wide variety of activities, some of which is pretty obvious and, dare I say, overt, but falls under this bracket of covert action because it is unacknowledged. And I think quite often we, we obsess over secrecy and we, we, we equate secrecy with not being seen. And actually, you know, there's some interesting work coming out of America by American scholars on this, the secrecy is made up of two things, exposure and acknowledgement. And what we see with many covert actions is that they are actually quite exposed. Mossad ones, particularly the kinetic Mossad ones, being a great example. Certain CIA drone strikes being another example. Russian assassination op operations being another example. Some of these, you know, the, the bigger, the noisier ones, any kind of secret war. It's a horrible oxymoron. They are visible, but they are unacknowledged. And that, I think, is the, is the key uh, to, to understanding this, is that they have that ambiguity or implausibly deni implausible deniability. And what, what's really important to remember is that just because an operation is exposed or is visible does not mean it has failed. Because it might, it might do, but it does not necessarily mean that it's failed because the operation might well be intended to send a message, to signal resolve. Um, and I'm plagiarizing that regularly here. This is all a scholar called Austin Carson who writes on this from Chicago, great guy. Um, so came action, it's, it's, kind of, it's a paradox. It's, it's, it's got audiences, you're signaling, you're targeting, you're communicating. But what's key, which makes it covert, is that it's not acknowledged. And that gives it this ambiguity, it gives it this implausible deniability. And I think some of Mossad stuff falls into that into that category, but then at the same time, there's a spectrum because we also then have operations which are designed to be untraceable. And if the if the foreign hand was discovered, it would it would ruin the operation. But all these things fall under that that banner of covert action. It's a very broad banner covering so much stuff. I mean, even in the American literature, using just America as a case study, it covers everything unattributable propaganda operations all the way up through to secret wars and assassination. That's a hell of a scope of, of stuff. Not that America does assassinations anymore, I should, should add, um, in historical literature, when they try and bump off Castro and people. It's all part of this banner of covert action, which is huge. And analytically, it's very broad. It's, it's, difficult. it's a difficult concept to get your head around, I think, sometimes. Yeah. Maybe intended to be like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Each podcast, I ask whoever I'm talking to a bit of advice or a lot of advice, whatever you can offer to a young person that wants to get into either scholarship or intelligence, because 
I speak to a, a wide range of, of, of researchers and scholars and, and practitioners. From your perspective, you know, what is, you mentioned earlier that there is, you know, tensions on, on, on at least in British universities to, to do more or be more creative in, in, in their work and with, with, with money not being there. But from a young person's perspective, that's now trying to get into what you're doing, for example. What advice could you, could you bestow on them? It's a good question. And I'm slightly bitter because just yesterday I got yet another grant rejected, um, my, my 13th in a row. So I, I'm full of, I'm full of bitter and twisted advice at the moment and, and, frust and frustrations, but it's, it, it, it's, it's part of the job. And the, the, the advice that, that I would give is that failure and rejections are entirely normal. And it can become quite difficult in academia because it's quite personal. We are putting ourselves out there. You know, I'm giving you my arguments, my opinions, and that's based on me. It's based on my personal research, my interpretations, my readings. And if you think that they're all nonsense, then that you know, it, it, it's, it's personal. It's, it's, it, it's, it's hard to not take things personally when it's based on your research, your interpretation and your, and your arguments. And so when you get failures, which everybody does, whether it is writing a, you know, an article for a journal or the journal says, no, we're not publishing it, which happens all the time, whether it is going for funding to your research and the, and the funding council says, no, we're not doing it, which happens all the time, as I know far too well, it's about resilience and it's about being able to, to carry on and think, yeah, well, that's, that's been rejected, but the next one might not. And I think it's important for senior scholars don't quite put myself in that category yet, but it's important for senior scholars to to normalise that and not just only ever talk about all their great successes and all the money they've won and all the great books they've written. Because, and I know this from looking at other people's CVs, the most successful scholars around have huge lists of failures, huge lists. It's, you know, they're still, they're still only being funded 10% of the time or whatever. They're just putting in lots and lots and lots of bits. So I think the advice that I'm, and I'm talking to myself now, as much as to tell the ones having gone through, is that, it, you know, it, that this happens, that this is normal rejection is part of the job. It's not a personal thing. And it should, as long as it's handled constructively and not, and as long as it's handled constructively, it's, it's, it's learning out, learning mechanism and uh, we can all move forward. That's what I'm telling myself anyway. <laughs> I think that's a great piece of advice. We should normalize sharing failures or um, maybe better set lessons, you know, on, on maybe how not to do things or how to do them better next time. I think that that's a great point. Is there a difference in the route that you've taken in intelligence studies than maybe history or, or any of the other humanities that you think requires something different? It's a, it's a funny question because, well, it's not a funny question, it's a funny answer because I, I, I see myself as a historian. I don't self-identify as, as an intelligence studies person, if you, if, you, if you like, which might sound odd given what I write about. But the British approach to intelligence has always been to embed it in the wider foreign policy and bureaucracy and machinery of state. And I don't think it's particularly helpful to look at intelligence entirely in isolation because that can end up leading to these assumptions which we've been discussing about, you know, overemphasizing the importance of intelligence, uh, overemphasizing the agency and potency of code actions. This all takes place within a much wider environment of, of foreign policy, defense policy, uh, information e uh, ecosystem. In, in British history, it takes place against the backdrop of decolonization and all these factors. And I think it's, it's a bit misleading to look at it in isolation. So I see myself as a historian. I see myself as a historian hiding in the politics department, which is a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, and I'll be entirely honest, I ended up in the politics department because that's where the job was. Uh, I, apply, I applied for a history job and I finished my PhD and I applied for a politics job and I, I got politics. I like politics. I, I think, you know, you make it, make it work for you. I, 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 there's a few historians in Nottingham in the politics department, so it's quite, it's quite nice. But it, uh, well, that's the other, the other thing, isn't it? It's, it's serendipity. It's, you, you go where the jobs are and, and, and that impacts on your career. If, if a job in history had come up when I was 25, I might be, I might be doing a very different, different subject. Who knows?
I think it's, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I think sadly for the wrong reasons, I think there's a tension between practitioners and as scholars, right? And, and I talked about this with, with other scholars in the podcast that it doesn't need to be right. So I think if there was a bit more collaboration and more openness towards each other, I think the work would become better. And particularly when it comes to like training and, and preparing young people to go into the, either in the scholars, scholarly field or, or in the practitioner field, particularly in the practitioner field, something a little bit different. Uh, and I know you, you've, you've written a lot. What are you reading or watching any cultural recommendations that you think if it doesn't have to be in COVID action, it would be nice, but, uh, cultural recommendations. I'm a. I am embarrassed to me. I'm a cultural wasteland. <laughs> I, I, what, what, have been, what have I been watching? I've been watching the latest stage of the crown because I'm now into that. I haven't written a, I haven't written a book on it. I've also actually been watching, I've been watching a bit of the, don't judge me, but a bit of the Harry and Meghan Netflix stuff that came out recently. That was, that, that, that's quite interesting. But I don't actually, watch or read anything about intelligence from a fiction side of things. I, I never have done. When I, when I finish work, I want something completely different. And I never understand people who write about this stuff all day and then spend their evenings reading Le Carre for fun. I mean, mm. he's a great writer, don't get me wrong, but you want, I, want a bit, I want something completely different. I want to watch Harry and Meghan or, or some sort of dodgy reality TV. But then maybe I'm just not an intellectual. No, I think you are. It makes me feel bad. This is the answer pretty much I've gotten throughout the podcast. That when people, <laughs> yeah, so you don't have to feel guilty about it because I think a lot of people just want to, if you are a researcher, an analyst, or, um, and reading is your job, obviously you don't want to, you know, continue doing that in your free time. Some people do, I respect to them, but I, I think we're pretty much in the same boat. I don't read at, as much about intelligence because I already do that enough. So, so it's not necessary. That is interesting that you said. You look, the other worry that this, that I have, if I, if I start reading fiction about intelligence, then I just I worry it will start seeping into my brain as being true. And I think I like, where did I, where did I read that? It was a great academic <laughs> book. It must've been, it must've been this. And then I'll remember, I'll actually know it was, it was in bond or something, not, not everything. So let's try to keep the two separate. As a, as a, as a scholar on COVID action, what is your opinion on the Bond movies? I know they're obviously not realistic, but I would love to hear from you what you think of it. Yeah, well, the, the, the obvious and boring answer is they're not realistic and they're complete nonsense, uh, which is true. I'm not a massive fan. I mean, lots of my colleagues level this stuff. I, I'm not. I'm not because it's it's not an intellectual snobbery thing. I just it's just not. That's, it's not not really my cup of tea. What I think is what I think is. Interesting. The more interesting answer about Bond isn't that it's nonsense and silly, which it is. It's the interplay between the, the fact and the fiction that I find quite interesting. When you read colleagues who research this stuff and they, they, they write about how directors of the CIA back in the 1960s were watching James Bond films or reading Ian Fleming books and then thinking this stuff was real and going back to the CIA and telling their equivalent of Q to go and build whatever crazy thing Ian Fleming was coming up with. I find that interplay really quite fascinating. Yeah, that is very interesting. I mean, thank you so much. I mean, it, it felt like it went re fast really quickly. I had, I had questions, so you answered them so well. So uh, I don't really have any more questions. Is there anything else, you know, maybe something you're working on that, that you would that you would like to mention? It all depends on the thorny issue of academic funding. I'm hoping to do I hope I'm hoping to do some more stuff on British history, some 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 interesting interesting files got released over the last couple of years that I'd like to look at. Um, but I'm currently working on a, a funding bid to secure money to go and do that, which I won't I won't I'll spare you my rant. <laughs> Don't worry about it. We, we, um, we have to go through them a <laughs> bit on our certain projects. So I know you're paid, but thank you so much, Rory. I really appreciate you taking the time and uh, it was fascinating right. speaking to you and I'm happy you was able to do it. My pleasure. 
Hey everybody, thank you for listening to the Great Dynamics Podcast with a wonderful conversation with Rory Cormack. I wanted to remind you guys that we started a new subscription on our website where you can get access to all of our latest reports, analysis, guides, video analysis. And also if you take the premium subscription, we give you guys access also to our Slack where you can communicate with our analysts and other like-minded members of our community and we can continue to grow. Thank you guys and have a great